Hi, welcome back to Pack Your Nursing Minutes. Thanks for joining me for this next portion of our pain management series where we discuss local blocks. So come along with me. Blocks act at the conduction level by blocking the sodium channels and blocking the nerve transmission. Now for our local anesthetics, um, this is when the surgeon does a local infiltrate, sometimes a field block in the OR where he puts multiple injections around a regional area, or they're just putting it an injection at each laparoscopic site um, for the procedure. And usually this is done with lidocaine, bupivacaine, or Expirel. Uh, so lidocaine is the shortest acting medication. Um, it acts within a minute, and then it's usually out of the system within two hours. So usually by the time they come out of the OR, they no longer have pain relief where that local was placed. Um, if the epinephrine is added to the anesthetic, to the lidocaine or the bupivacaine, then that will prolong the duration, the absorption, because of the vasoconstriction properties of the epinephrine. So it makes it last longer. So if you have lido with epi, then it can last maybe up to four hours. If you have bupivacaine, that's going to last anywhere from two to four hours. And then if it's bupivacaine with epi, then that can be as long as seven to 10 hours. And then our longest acting local anesthetic is a newer drug called Expirel. And Expirel is very expensive, um, but it will give pain relief up to 72 hours because it's bupivacaine wrapped in a liposomal capsule. So it's a slow absorption, a slow release of the bupivacaine over time. So our next topic is regional anesthesia. And this is when the anesthesiologist will be focusing either on a group of nerves like a plexus, like the brachial plexus or a specific nerve like the femoral nerve. So we'll briefly go over the common areas and what types of surgeries that's associated with. But it's when you're blocking a specific area of the body. And the regional anesthesia, you'll definitely see this recommended with the ERAS, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Guidelines. It has shown to decrease um, post-op pain, post-op opioid use, and improve patient satisfaction with their surgeries. Common regional blocks are brachial plexus. So your um, Intrascaling, uh, this is a common area, and this is going to be where you're going to be blocking the shoulder. So if you're doing a reverse total shoulder replacement um, or a rotator cuff repair, they may have an intrascaling block. Uh, then we also have um, supraclavicular, intraclavicular, and axillary, but I, I have to say I see the intrascaling done the most for the brachial plexus region. Um, then there's a beer block that is good for the distal forearm and hand surgery. And then we have our paravertebral block that is for the thoracic, the breast, the abdominal, and the pelvic surgery patient population. And if you do a lot of thoracic surgeries, you may see this block used more frequently within your um, anesthesiology's practice group. And then the TAP block, the transverse abdominal plane block. This is going to be used um, for our lower abdominal surgery patient population. They will need to do both sides, right and left side. Uh, the negative thing about the TAP block is it usually doesn't cover the midline region, so they can still feel some pain in that area. Uh, then there's the femoral nerve block. This is common with our total knee surgeries and our adductor canal block, again, with our knees, our foot, and our ankle surgeries, our popliteal block for ankle and foot surgery, and ankle block for ankle and foot surgery. Probably the most common ones that I've seen in practice is the intrascaling, beer block, depending on the procedure, uh, the tap block, the femoral nerve block, the adductor canal block, and the ankle blocks. Now with regional anesthesia, you always want to be um, looking out for several complications that could occur. And some of those complications are last, local anesthesia systemic toxicity. Your patient will report ringing in their ears or a metallic taste in their mouth. They may all of a sudden become hypotensive, hypoxic. And so you are going to get out your lipid emulsion fusion and begin infusing that. You're gonna give them 100% oxygen supporting their airway. Um, and if you, and if it does become a pre-code situation, then you move forward with your ACLS guidelines. There can also be block failure. 
And then depending on where their block is, like for an intrascaline block, I have seen um, respiratory depression with that as much as 25%. Uh, especially in our COPD patient populations, they could get like a pneumothorax. And um, so you definitely want to be very cautious and having a conversation with anesthesia about these patients who are high risk um, for some of these blocks because they may need more support. They may need BiPAP. You may need to do a chest x-ray. You may have to do a chest tube. So I'm just going to throw all that out there. And in the future, I will have additional education, but you also um, want to consider nerve injury, infection, and potential for a hematoma, also allergies. So I just wanna talk about um, the regional blocks because these are the blocks that we are doing in the PACU after their surgery. Most likely we're assisting anesthesia with these procedures. So some nursing considerations to consider when you are preparing your patient to have a post-op regional block with anesthesia. First off, you wanna make sure that you have consent and that was obtained in the pre-op area for this procedure post-op. Um, you also wanna know who is your provider who's going to be doing this, which anesthesiologist? Is it your anesthesiologist in charge, um, your AIC, or is it um, whoever's covering lunches. <laughs> so these are very important things to find out who's going to be doing it because it will delay the time in which you get this block on board. And sometimes these patients, sometimes anesthesia is available and the ultrasound's available and the line cart's available and we can do it immediately and um, have a smooth transfer of pain management. And sometimes it takes a while and you're waiting over an hour for anesthesia to finish up with an emergency in the OR. And that's just how the business goes. So you do wanna know who's going to do it and get all of the resources available. So as the nurse, make sure you have consent, make sure they don't have any allergies to any of the anesthetics, make sure they don't have any contraindications. If you feel they have any contraindications, have that conversation with anesthesia before you go forward with the block have the ultrasound ready, have the line cart there, make sure that you have the lipid infusion if you need it in case you have a last situation. Um, make sure that lipid infusion is not expired. I have found expired lipid infusions. Um, so just go that extra mile making sure that you're prepared. Uh, make sure your IV is working because when you need it, you need it. Make sure you have your Ambu bag ready to go if you need it. Um, make sure they're on the heart monitor, take note of their rhythm which I know you're already doing that because you're right there at the bedside. And then also communicate this to your charge nurse or to whoever's floating and helping out within the department that you're about to do a block. You're gonna be unavailable for 20 to 30 minutes. You won't be able to take a second patient because you need to be there supporting anesthesia, maintaining a sterile technique, monitoring the patient for last, and then intervening if a complication does occur. Because if a complication does occur, you're gonna need way more than a nurse and an anesthesiologist. Just things that I want to throw out there for you to consider and always review your hospital's policy procedure for your last guidelines. Now, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about these peripheral nerve block catheters, um, continuous peripheral nerve blocks. I have seen these more and more over the last three years and uh, patients are going home with them. So what it is, is it's a catheter that is placed um, in a, a certain area near the, that nerve, and it gives a, an infiltrate of a low dose anesthetic, usually ropivacaine. And this is giving patients three days worth of pain management. We've had really good success with this. Anesthesia manages this. So when the patient goes home, they need to have the anesthesiologist's cell phone number available written down on the discharge instructions because they're going to call the anesthesiologist if they have any complications. And you do still want to teach the patient about LAST because LAST can happen with these con continuous infusion pumps um, of infiltrate of uh, local anesthesia. So um, just make sure you're including that in your discharge instructions and in your discharge conversation. And also teach them signs and symptoms of infection and how also to remove the catheter because they'll be removing the catheter once the pump is empty at 72 hours. So I hope you've enjoyed the block portion of our pain management. If you like this channel and I'm giving you value added, please subscribe, please share it with your peers and drop me a comment. I would love to hear what you all are doing in your hospital 
uh, for pain management in regards to blocks. Uh, if you have a block team, uh, if you have a special area where you do blocks or you just do it at the bedside. Um, I know every hospital is a little bit different on how they do things. So if you're new to the PACU, find out the routine in your hospital. And I just thank you for tuning into PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy. I will catch you next week when we talk about opioids.